welcome to the Veterinary Break Room. I'm Dr. Beth Mollison, and we're excited to sit down with Dr. Peggy Burris today to discuss her recent trip to Tanzania with Mission Rabies. And before we, before we dive in, a quick note of appreciation for the continued support of our volunteers with sponsor Merck Animal Health. And not only does Merck provide the Novavac rabies vaccine for all Mission Rabies drives around the world, but through a years-long partnership with Clinicians Brief, they actually allow us to send multiple volunteers to participate in these drives each year. And between the 2023 Tanzania and Cambodia efforts, we're able to send 12 volunteers this year with assistance from Merck. And the amazing experiences you're about to hear about are made accessible with their support. And if you'd like to register your interest in upcoming 2024 vaccination drives, reach out to us at volunteers at briefmedia.com. Now let's dive in with Dr. Peggy Burris. Welcome back to the Veterinary Break Room. I'm Dr. Alyssa Watson, and I co-host this podcast with my good friend and colleague, Dr. Beth Mullison. Most days in the break room, Dr. Beth and I chat about any number of veterinary related topics, some serious, others just for fun. But once in a while, we do get to shake things up a little bit and have a guest on the show. And today is one of those days. So I am super excited to welcome another member of our brief media team, Dr. Peggy Burris. Hi, Dr. Burris. <laughs> Hello. I'm so honored to be here. Oh, we're so excited. So Dr. Peggy is here to talk about her recent uh, experience in Tanzania, volunteering with Mission Rabies. And for those of you who might be unfamiliar with this organization, Mission Rabies is a United Kingdom-based charity group with the goal of eliminating human rabies by the year 2030. Um, it's near and dear to my heart because I had uh, the, the wonderful opportunity of volunteering with them in Goa, India back in 2018. And so we're going to talk a little bit about my experiences and a little bit about Dr. Peggy's recent experiences. Uh, but before we do that, could you let the audience know a little bit about yourself, Dr. Peggy? You've been with Brief even longer than I have, so... Sure. I um, am Dr. Peggy Burris. I live in Ohio, and I am a small animal practitioner in addition to working with Brief Media. I joined Brief in 2014, and in 2015, uh, Brief started a partnership with Mission Rabies, and that is how I heard about it the first time. Um, I was so intrigued by the idea that I let the powers that be know that if there was ever an opening or a spot that I could join a trip, that I would love to do that, and I got my chance in in 2019 and then again very recently. Wonderful, Peggy. We're so glad you had a great trip, which we will get to here. And just to give our audience a little bit of background, um, as far as, again, t Alyssa touched on this, but the mission of Mission Rabies is to eradicate rabies by the year 2030. Right now, it's estimated that about 59,000 people die from rabies each year, with 40% of those being children under the age of 15. Um, so very devastating. This has an estimated 100, 100 children die from rabies each day. So obviously, to give you some scope of how important this mission is and how excited we are to be a part of it. Um, and yeah, I am the only one here who has not gotten to experience what it's like to be a volunteer with this organization. So we're excited to hear, or I'm excited to hear more about it, as I know our audience is too. But um, Peggy, it sounds like you, ever since you heard about it, were gung-ho, wanting to join the trip. So kind of tell us a little bit more about how this trip came to fruition and what was it like to kind of get ready for this experience. I'd love to. So um, like you mentioned, the statistics around rabies are, are very sobering and, and very serious. We're very lucky in this country that, you know, it's not one of the number one um, health issues that, you know, our children have to deal with, but that's not the case in, in other parts of the world. And, you know, once you hear those numbers, it's hard to sit back and, and not try to do something about them. And as a veterinarian, um, this is a way that, you know, we can concretely try to help, um, help them achieve their goals. So, um, I was lucky enough to be able to participate in a project in Uganda in 2019. Uh, Brief was able to uh, compile a small group of volunteers um, to go on this trip, and I was lucky to be one of them. Uh, there was another uh, coworker that was that was asked to go as well, and uh, that was my first time. Um, I did not know exactly um, what to expect, although I will say Mission Rabies prepares the volunteers very well ahead of time. Um, but I did know that, you know, I definitely believed in the mission and 100% uh, just wanted to get over there and, and, and do some good. 
and Alyssa, you might be able to add to this as well, but as far as like vaccinations or I know it sounds like there's maybe some physical demands once you get there, what was it like to have to, to do those preparations? Yeah. So for me, it was a little while ago now. Like I said, I, I went to Goa, India in 2018. And so so I don't remember, um, you know, exactly everything that I went through, although certainly making sure my passport was up to date, doing all of that. And I did have to get several vaccines. Um, you do need to be vaccinated for rabies and have a current titer. And I think it was within uh, four months. Is that correct, Peggy, the titer? It's in that range for sure. Um, yeah, you either so, have to show a recent rabies vaccine or a very recent titer because you mm -hmm. are working directly with animals. Right. Sure. And so I um, I actually chose to get boosted because I hadn't been I hadn't received my rabies vaccine since uh, since vet school uh, <laughs> back in you know 2002 2003 in that time and so I, I skipped the titer and I just went and got boosted and I wanted to get some other you know vaccines at the same time so I I think I ended up getting seven shots that day at the travel clinic <laughs> and they gave me a lollipop so I was really excited. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you were a good girl. <laughs> I was. <laughs> there, there definitely are some physical demands. Uh, certainly for us, we did a lot of walking. Um, we'll talk a little bit about this, Dr. Peggy, with um, you know the way that the different drives are set up. Uh, a lot of it has to do with how you know the local communities are. There are static clinics where people bring in their dogs to you to vaccinate. Um, but there's also, you know, when we were in India, there are a lot of free roaming dogs. And so we did a lot of walking um, and actually we had we partnered with with local people um, and the organizations locally in order to catch the dogs in these giant almost like butterfly nets, um, but, and then to vaccinate them that way. So, so there was quite a bit of physical activity. I know I had to get ready a little bit for that. And, and even then at the end of the days, I was pretty exhausted. We spent, you know, up at 5 AM and, and hours and hours walking. So. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would definitely agree. You know, you don't need to be an Olympic athlete to be able to do a mission rabies trip, but it definitely helps to have, you know, at least a moderate level of fitness. Um, I believe that some of the some of the projects they recommend that you should be able to comfortably walk about 10k um, in the heat. And most of our days were not like that in Uganda and in Tanzania. But there was one day in Uganda where our group was assigned to a very hilly area. And I remember just that night checking my phone to see how many steps I'd gotten that day, and it it had said that I had climbed 120 flights of stairs which I could not do in normal life. But <laughs> evidently, if I'm looking for dogs, I can I can do that. <laughs> yes, where there's a will, there's a way, it sounds like, Peggy. Um, and tell us a little bit more. I just, you know, when I picture you there, I don't quite know how to picture your accommodations and kind of what your schedule was like. So give us a snapshot into what it felt to like to actually be there. There's definitely a variation depending on your location and, and the way that project is set up. Um, but the two that I've been on were were similar. We stayed in various hotels and guest houses in Uganda. And in Tanzania, we stayed in the same guest house the whole time. Um, we had shared rooms uh, so that we were paired up and two of us would share a bedroom, which had very comfortable uh, single beds and some furnishings. And we each had um, our own shared bathroom then in that room too. It definitely was not you know, four-star luxury accommodations, mm -hmm. but it had everything that we needed and it was quite comfortable. There was no air conditioning in Tanzania and it was quite warm while we were there. Um, so that was a little bit of an adjustment, but honestly, coming from the United States in January, it, I did not complain <laughs> a bit about Worth it. feeling warm. Exactly. Um, in Uganda, we moved quite a bit and so the accommodations varied, uh, but they all were comfortable. I will say that you um, that Mission Rabies does take care of all of your basic needs and and you know I never felt like we were anywhere that was unsafe or you know very uncomfortable. It it was all it was all quite nice. Yeah. Alyssa, yeah, what had, was it like in in India? 
Yeah, we had a beautiful place in India. We stayed at the same uh, hotel accommodations the whole time. Uh, we were really lucky. We had Wi-Fi. I was able to FaceTime back home with my family, um, even though there was a big time difference. Nice. <laughs> so, but uh, one of the things that I loved about it so much, honestly, was the food. We had dinner each night all together, you know, um, with the team, and the local food was incredible. The curry in India is wonderful and um it was that was one of the things that i always that i always remember about it was those evenings sitting with the team talking about your day sharing everybody's experiences it was a really big you know bonding experience i'm still very good friends with several of the other international volunteers that i met on the drive um and you know people have such a powerful reaction to it they want to go back again and again <laughs> mm-hmm and when you talk about your team, Alyssa, I know, of course, there's a few volunteers here with Clinician's Brief even that go each time, but is it an, inter an international draw and how big of a team were you moving with while you were there? Yeah, it's it's absolutely an international team. Again, the organization itself is is based out of the United Kingdom. Um, and so we, we had vets from uh, all over the world. Um, and yeah, it was really, really great. And funny enough, my, when we were partnered up, we were partnered up with another veterinarian, um, and, and my partner, uh, Dr. Plotnik, Dr. Arnie was actually on this last drive with you, Dr. Peggy. <laughs> he was, he was. So I would say that Definitely vaccination and, and you know, performing the, the duties of a volunteer are wonderful and just, just as wonderful as getting to know your fellow volunteers. Um, we had volunteers from France, Germany, England, Scotland, United States, uh, and it was, just, it was just so lovely to get to know our fellow volunteers. They all come from different clinical situations and some that are retired and some that are brand new and uh, but you're all there for the same purpose, and you all enjoy traveling, clearly, and, and uh, you know, you all work together that whole week, and so you really get a chance to get to know each other very well. Yeah, and what are your interactions with the members of the community like? Like, I know, of course, with the team, there's the team bonding there. How deep do you go in the community as far as when you're actually vaccinating and having social interactions with them as well? So it starts with your team. Um, Mission Rabies has, before before we arrived in Tanzania, Mission Rabies had already started working with some local volunteers um, who ended up being our, our drivers during the days that we were doing door-to-door um, -door clinics. Um, and then also volunteers that were our translators um, because they speak Swahili in Tanzania. And unfortunately, I think I know three Swahili words. Um, so it, they are essential. Um, and so, first of all, you get to know those people uh, because you're riding around in a van with them or sitting at a static clinic with them for eight hours a day. Um, but then you also get to meet the people in the community where you're vaccinating. And, and that was such a rewarding experience. Um, a lot of the dogs and cats were brought to us by children, and they were always so curious about what we were doing um, and, you know, why we were treating the dogs, and, and they just really wanted to learn all about it. So that was probably one of my favorite parts is, is actually getting out in the community and meeting the local people and um, and watching, you know, them interact with, with their own dogs and, and see little slices of their own life, too. I think it's important to comment here, too, that um, not only does Mission Rabies, you know, have this focus on vaccination, but they also have a very big educational campaign with dog bite prevention, um, you know, uh, talks for children. Um, and so that is one thing. Do, did, did you have the little Mission Rabies bracelets, Peggy, when you were there, the little yellow bracelets to we give out? We did for the Uganda trip. Yeah. Yes. So, and if you want to have kids come to you, just have bracelets. <laughs> have bracelets. That was one thing that mm -hmm. I loved as well. Um, we did have these little yellow bracelets that we could give out to the children. And um, I will tell you, as you know, I mentioned earlier, 
I, I didn't do any static clinics, so I didn't have anybody bringing their animals to me. So we were we were always out looking, and there was a very large, you know, free roaming dog population in in Goa, India, and kids always knew where those dogs were. Always, <laughs> they always knew where the dogs were. They always knew, especially mama dogs that had puppies. They'd show us. They'd bring <laughs> us around this big, beautiful banyan tree, and there would be, you know, a little almost den in there with a mama dog and eight puppies. And that was those kids always knew where to go. <laughs> and what were the dogs there like? Like, were they? Did they have any, you know, a stranger fear seeing you guys come in? Or what was the experience interacting with the animals themselves? So it definitely varied on the location. I will say that the status of dogs um, in Africa, from what I saw, is a little bit different than the status of dogs here in the United States. You know, at the clinic at work, I see dogs that are brought in wearing sweaters and matching leashes, and they're in a baby carrier. And in in Africa... (laughs) You know, families have dogs, um, not just as pets, but also for protection of livestock. Um, so their relationship with the pet is just a little bit different. Um, and the pets aren't as, are as used to being handled or restrained mm-hmm. because it just isn't something that comes up in their daily life. So a little more skittish, um, maybe a little less amenable to being pet just because that's not their life. And they're, they're also given... They're owned, but they're, they do free roam. Um, so they're used to just being able to go wherever they want to. Um, so there was a little bit of an adjustment with that, but um, most of the families were very willing to learn how to restrain their dog. And, and it was really nice to see that reaction. I mean, you know, both parties would sometimes be a little bit nervous and then they would get through it. And, and, um, and uh, it was, we were able to vaccinate the dog safely. Um, but it's, it's definitely different. I had to laugh when I got back to work the following week and, you know, the first poodle comes in that's, you know, literally wearing (laughs) probably a nicer outfit than the one I have in my closet. And, um, it just, it made me laugh. (laughs) Cultural differences for sure. But no, that's, that's really interesting insight. Is that kind of your experience too, Alyssa? Yeah, my favorite was the dogs on the roofs. So we would be walking through the community and there would be dogs everywhere. Dogs up on the roof, dogs dogs under the bridge. So um, that was one thing to just kind of get used to a little bit. Um, certainly, uh, same thing with other animals in India. Cows were, were always everywhere too. So getting having to stop on on the highway we did a lot of driving around as well to some other communities and and so yep having to stop and wait for for the cows to cross the street was a little bit different than i'm used to (laughs) so in tanzania i not to one up you Alyssa, but in tanzania we had to stop to let a giraffe cross the street it was amazing that definitely one ups me. I would, I would love to stop to watch a giraffe cross the street. It was one of those moments where I just had to like take a deep breath and look around and realize that, you know, I was having an amazing, just an otherworldly experience, and and I was just so appreciative to have the chance to to be there and be doing what we were doing, and to see a giraffe cross the street. <laughs> yes, trying to live in the moment as much as you can when you see that, right? And you did actually have a little break in the middle of your drive, right, Dr. Peggy, to see some other some other animals and some other parts of, of Tanzania. What did you guys get to do? We did. So our, our planned schedule is to do five days of vaccinating and then have a two-day break and then do five more days of vaccinating before we all headed home. And during that two-day break, they had arranged the option for us to do some safari. Uh, so we got to see two of the national parks. Um, just outside of Arusha, where we were we were centered, um, the first day we got to go to Terengire National Park, uh, where we were able to see lions and um, elephants, which was absolutely amazing. And I <laughs> cried because elephants, I, they're just, they're my favorite. Um, and then we actually camped out that night. And the next day we were taken to um, Norongoro Crater, uh, which is an amazing place definitely a bucket list trip (laughs) checked off there. Um, In the crater, it's the scope of it is just massive, but it is just a crater full of animals. And in this season where we went, there were a lot of babies and just life happening everywhere you looked. We saw 
uh, lions hunting. We saw zebras and wildebeests and hippos and rhinocer- rhinoceri, rhinoceroses. What is the plural of rhinoceros? I think <laughs> rhinoceri. Whatever you want it to be, Peg. <laughs> exactly. Rhinoceri. Um, warthogs. And I'll tell you what, I had no idea how cute a baby warthog was until I went to Africa. They are absolutely adorable. Um, but we were able to to see a lot of animals take a million pictures. And um, it was, I, I overuse this word, but it was amazing. It was awesome and amazing. And I would love to go back and do it all again, even if we went to the same two places. And then we just all felt so invigorated to hit the vaccines hard the next five days after that that re- that reward. In Uganda, um, during our break, I actually got to go gorilla trekking, which is another bucket list item. Uh, we wow. were able to we were able to hike a little bit into uh, the rainforest and actually encounter wild gorillas. Um, and I mean, you're close enough that you can look into their eyes. It was I was awestruck. It was it was absolutely amazing. Yep, we had a a little break in the middle of our drive too. And so we did a yoga retreat um, in Southern Goa, uh, which I'm not a huge yoga person, but this place was amazing. And I even did an hour of yoga under the banyan tree one morning. So, um, and I got to stay in a tree house and uh, there were monkeys. So that was my big thing (laughs) when we were there. That was my, my, the wildlife that, you know, I had wanted to see and encounter. And there they were right outside my window as I went to sleep and woke up in the morning. So that was awesome. That sounds beautiful. Did you have to worry about them stealing your things? Uh, Probably. They they probably would have (laughs) stolen our things. (laughs) Yeah. Our group had several monkey encounters as well, including one that actually came into a vehicle. It was our vehicle. And stole a entire package of cookies and then very proudly sat in a tree above the vehicle eating the cookies. And when they were done, they just dropped the wrapper and we picked it up and went on our way and she went on her way and that was that. So Peggy, for a typical day on this trip, I want to hear kind of like, you know, you wake up and then what does it actually look look like? What does your full day look like? Sure. So on one of the days where we were vaccinating, we would typically all wake up pretty early, usually around 6 a.m., and we would meet for breakfast. We'd have a fresh cooked breakfast every day. And then by 7 o'clock, we would assemble all of our supplies, and we would we would go out to our locations and start vaccinating. If it was a static clinic day, then what, what would happen is we would set up um, ourselves and our supplies in the yard of a school or a church or another designated area. And beforehand, an announcement would have been made um, to let the community know that we were there. And sometimes those announcements came through the church or through the school. Uh, but we also had a loudspeaker or a megaphone. And as we're driving toward the site, our local volunteer would be announcing through the megaphone who we were and why we were there and that if you had a dog or a cat that you were to bring them to us and we'll give you a free rabies vaccine. So oftentimes by the time we circled around a few times and then went to go set up, there was already a line of children waiting with their dogs to be vaccinated. Nice. We would stay there um, sometimes just for half a day and then move to a second location or sometimes we would stay at that static point all day if there was enough demand. And Um, each dog would receive a rabies vaccine. We would mark that dog with a red stripe right on the forehead um, so that there's a visual indication that that dog had been vaccinated. That way, if we saw it in town the next day, we would know we got that one already. Um, We would give the owner a vaccine card that would describe the pet and give the date and the sticker for the vaccine. Um, And then we would log that data um, in a special app that missions, Mission Rabies uses to help keep track of the location and the numbers of vaccines for each day. Um, sometimes we wouldn't do a static clinic, though. We would do what's called a roaming clinic. And on those days, we would either walk or drive around a community using the megaphone to ask if anyone had dogs. And they would bring them out to the street or to the corner, or we would announce that we would temporarily set up at a small location just for an hour or so, and they could bring dogs there. Um, And those days were really fun because we got to see more of the neighborhoods and the community that way. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, see the homes and and the beautiful farmland on the side of the mountain. And uh, it was, 
I mean, both days were really fun, but the the roaming points um, gave you a really nice view of, of you know, what life is like that, in that area. How does that vary from India? Yeah, so um, we didn't, you know, we didn't have there. They did do static clinics in in Goa in India, just not on the particular drive that I was on. Um, so uh, that we definitely went out through the community. And I guess the biggest difference is that, yeah, a lot of the dogs that we were vaccinating, we, we vaccinated own dogs where we would knock on doors and, and ask if they had any dogs. And people were so excited because uh, the, the drive in Goa is actually, um, that was the first place that Mission Rabies started. Um, you know, these campaigns is in Goa, so it's been going on there the longest. And so people in the community were, were quite familiar with mission rabies already. And they actually had vaccine cards, you know, from their dogs from years previous, and they would bring out their cards so that we could fill it out for them. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, kept their dog up to date. One of the goals is to have, you know, 70% coverage of, you know, 70% of the dog population covered. Mission Rabies has has really uh, analyzed that data and found that that's kind of the critical point in order to reduce, you um, uh, human deaths, you know, from from rabies, and so that app you were talking about, Peggy, is really important. It was it was developed, you know, for mission rabies. It it tracks, you know, the number of animals they've vaccinated, as well as you know, geographically where you've gone. We, I remember, I would look at that app at the end of the day, and it was a crazy zigzag of of where we had walked all over, um, and it just looked like some, you know, uh, modern art. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, we had the same thing. <laughs> so Peggy, do you have the final numbers from your recent drive in Tanzania? So because our drive just recently wrapped, I do not have the final numbers. We're still waiting on those. But I can share that in the first seven days of vaccinating, our group was able to vaccinate just over 3,500 animals. And Worldwide Veterinary Services also had a group that was working alongside us, and they were able to complete 250 spay and neuter procedures alongside us while we were there. Wow, that sounds pretty impressive to me. And I know there's a drive coming up. Is it in Cambodia, Peggy? Do you know when that drive is? There is. It's the biggest drive that Mission Rabies has has ever attempted. Uh, their goal is to try to vaccinate 100,000 animals in 10 days. Um, oh my gosh. It's, this, <laughs> it's coming up this May. So wow. yeah, if anybody is interested in following along, uh, you can find the Mission Rabies website. It's missionrabies.org or missionrabies.com. It is an ambitious project. Yeah, we'll have to say we'll have to follow up. It'll be fun to see how that drive turns out. And I think as we discuss all of this, we would be remiss not to mention that Merck Animal Health has donated more than 1 million doses of canine rabies vaccines to support um, the elimination, potential elimination of rabies. So it's a huge donation there that makes all of this amazing work possible. And of course, volunteers like you, Dr. Peggy and Dr. Alyssa, um, going out there and doing the hands-on work and truly saving lives out there. So we appreciate you spreading this message. Um, and I believe we will have resources for anyone that is interested in learning more about this project as well. So thank you, everyone, Dr. Peggy. Thank you for being our special guest here today. And thank you to our audience for joining us. And we will talk to everyone soon. You are so welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to today's episode of the Veterinary Break Room. If you enjoyed today's episode, you can find us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts, including a video version on YouTube. While you're there, make sure you subscribe, rate, and review. You can also listen or watch our podcast episodes on our website at cliniciansbrief.com slash podcasts, or drop us a line at podcasts at briefmedia.com. Veterinary Break Room is a brief media production produced by Alexis Ussery and co-hosted by Dr. Alyssa Watson and Dr. Beth Mollison.